Good morning, everybody. We are back for the day three of the CE Sustainable Finance Summit. And today, I guess, we will look at one of the most important topics that exists. It's energy. And energy is everything. It's the fundamentals of our economy. It is the thing that drives our economic growth. It's pretty much what charges your phone. And just imagine life without your phone. And today, we have an absolutely stellar lineup of speakers from across Europe, speakers from across different parts of the system, to discuss what do we need to do to ensure a sustainable energy transition. And I have the great privilege to welcome with us today Mary Burst Warlick from the International Energy Agency. She's the Deputy Director. She will join us for the first keynote remarks, followed very shortly by Mr. Giles Dixon, the CEO of Wind Europe, and finally, last but not least, Mr. Hans van der Loo, the Chairman of Institute for Integrated Economic Research, CEO Blue Cooling Initiative, and he's also a STEM ambassador. So without much delay, I would like to welcome Mary to the stage to join us for the first keynote remarks. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I don't know if you want me to sit or stand or what works best, but um, if you don't mind, actually, I think I will sit. Um, just like to say thank you so much for the invitation to join you today. Um, it's really a great pleasure, and I really look forward to the opportunity over the uh, hours ahead to uh, get to know um, some of you a little bit more. Um, and uh, yes, many thanks to Julian, um, who had the opportunity to meet uh, I guess it was in, uh, in, in England, yes, in, uh, in Oxford about a year ago for the invitation to, to be here. Um, the subject you're looking at is really of great importance um, to us at the International Energy Agency, I think, to, uh, to countries uh, really all around the world and certainly an area that we have been, um, we've been developing policy recommendations on. I'd just like to start by saying I think it's important to acknowledge the progress that's really being made in terms of the clean energy revolution. We see signs of it all across, uh, all across the, the spectrum in terms of um, government and industry responses to the global energy crisis. And uh, I think the clean energy revolution really is moving faster than many uh, realize. Uh, global clean, uh, global energy related CO2 emissions actually rose less than initially feared in 2022 as clean energy growth offset much of the impact of greater uh, coal and oil use. In fact, even if global CO2 emissions grew by 0.9% uh, last year, which they did, reaching a new high of over 36.8 gigaton, this would have been <clears throat> up to three times more if there had not been unprecedented deployment of clean tech, notably renewables, electric vehicles, and heat pumps. Last year, electric car sales accounted for close to 14% of the global car market, up from around 9% in 2021 and less than 5% in 2020. So this is a real, real, real improvement. Um, heat bumps, the central technology to secure and sustainable heating in buildings, surpassed the sales of gas furnaces and boilers uh, in the EU in recent years. And solar PV sales also grew in the last two years, aligned with what, in, in fact, uh, will be needed um, in the IEA's net zero by 2050 scenario. And the industry is set to keep this pace. So this is really important uh, in terms of developments. And already today, the pipeline of announced manufacturing capacity for solar would be sufficient to meet global demand for solar panels in 2030, again, under our net zero by 2050 scenario. Low-carbon low electricity is also getting uh, an important boost from the comeback of nuclear power in, uh, in many parts of the world. Um, people often ask what the IEA's approach is to nuclear, and we think that it certainly uh, can and is making an important contribution to um, our decarbonization um, goals. Moreover, in our 2022 World Energy Outlook stated policy scenario where we explore how the energy system evolves if we retain current policy settings, for the first time we saw global demand for fossil fuels is in fact peaking or plateauing. And these are all encouraging signs, which I think are really important to acknowledge. 
IEA's latest analysis shows that if governments all around the world achieve their NDCs and their net zero pledges in full or on time, and understand that the if is very important in terms of implementation, and if companies follow through on their own commitments in sectors such as aviation or shipping, then the global temperature increase would be limited to 1.7 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. However, to move on to the trajectory for 1.5 degrees Celsius in line with the Paris uh, commitment, we will need to address the main fault line in the fight against climate change. And that, in our view, is scaling up investments all around the world in clean energy and specifically in emerging uh, and developing economies. And there, first, we need to scale up the level of clean energy investments globally. At the IEA, we now estimate that government actions will help propel clean energy investment to new highs of more than $2 trillion a year by 2030, a rise of more than 50% from today. So this is a, a, a big, big challenge. However, we need to move on to the trajectory, to move on to the directory of 1.5 degrees, we'll have to accelerate to reach more than 4 trillion by 2030. So really, really quite sobering, but, uh, but we think achievable. 60% of this will need to be in emerging markets and developing economies, and that's where the gap lies. Currently, we see an imbalance um, in in which clean energy investments are investment, invested where they are investment, with advanced economies receiving an outsized portion of funding. Emerging markets and developing uh, economies make up 60% of demand, but they've only received less than half of clean energy investment. However, under current trends, we would have advanced economies concentrating 55% of clean energy investment in 2030, despite representing only one-third of energy demand. And this is even more important when we consider that the cost of capital for new solar and wind projects in emerging and developing economies is two to three times higher than it is in advanced economies. And this can double the effective price of the same projects in these regions. So if we do not find a way to quickly reorient the geographic spread of investment, the risk of two-speed transitions is, in fact, uh, very real. And this is also very relevant for this region, for Central and Eastern European countries, because a move towards low carbon energy offers high potential in this region and could also minimize its dependency on fossil fuels while maintaining energy security and supporting a just and inclusive clean energy transition. Um, but financing clean energy projects um, remains really the main hurdle. So against this backdrop, the financial community has a, has a really key role to play, no question, in the orderly allocation of capital away from fossil fuels and towards, uh, first, the massive ramp up of clean energy spending globally, and second, towards emerging markets and developing economies in particular. In the last year alone, we've seen some positive signs that provide strong indications that the direction of travel is the right one. Uh, in an upcoming report, and that is specifically the World Energy Investment 2023, one of uh, the IEA's flagship reports, which we'll be publishing next month, we'll be highlighting, among other things, that we uh, have seen a growing number of financial institutions pledging to align their financing with net zero scenarios, which is really very welcome. Uh, second, an increasing number of countries have uh, now introduced green taxonomies, including South Korea, Indonesia, Mexico, South Africa, Colombia, Sri Lanka, and Georgia, with more countries announcing their plan uh, to plans to develop new green tech taxonomies, such as Australia. And China has also moved forward, publishing in 2020 the green bond principles and the common ground taxonomy. And regulators from 13 jurisdictions have introduced or proposed new disclosure requirements on ESG or on sustainable funds to improve labeling. There's also been a proliferation of non-financial reporting uh, standards and regulation, generally emphasizing emissions and climate risk disclosures. And these include the two voluntary standards uh, from the International Sustainability Standards Board, IFSR 1 and 2, on climate-related reporting and the EU Corporate Sustainable Reporting Directive, which will require large and listed companies to report on, among other things, their environmental risks, opportunities, and impacts. 
and a growing number of central banks are conducting climate stress tests, um, and in at least 18 jurisdictions, banks either are or will soon be subject to requirements to implement such testing. And this is important as the European Central Bank um, conducted a climate stress test in 2022, as some of you may know, and found that 60% of the 104 participant banks did not have a climate stress testing framework in place and that about two-thirds of banks' income from non-financial non corporate customers stems from greenhouse gas-intensive industries. And there's also been a growing number of public finance initiatives to support an increase in clean energy spending, such as the Bridgetown Initiative announced by Barbados Prime Minister Motley at COP27 um, that proposes um, several steps to reform development and climate financing. So that's a bit of a preview for our upcoming World um, Energy Investment Report. While these are all <clears throat> encouraging signs, no doubt, and nevertheless more needs to be done, um, especially to overcome the structural issues and the limited pool of investable assets that are preventing capital from flowing to the emerging markets, um, and that restrict the amount of equity and debt investment into clean energy in these economies. Currently, over 80% of financial assets are held in advanced economies. Uh, seven advanced economies alone account for nearly 90% of global pension funds, which can provide a valuable source of patient capital. And the inevitable universe in emerging markets and developing economies shrinks even further when um, <clears throat> considering climate-aligned benchmarks, MSCI's Emerging Markets Climate Paris Aligned Index <clears throat> includes only 427 constituents, 30% compared to 13, uh, 1,300 or so in the Emerging Markets Index that's based on uh, where only 3.4% of the index are energy companies and utilities. And of the nearly 5,000 companies that have committed to set science-based targets, only 16% are in emerging markets and developing economies, and 29% of those are in China. Um, so this influences the ESG scores. Listed firms from emerging markets and developing economies tend to have lower ESG scores on average than their advanced economy peers. And advanced economies still account for over 80% of issuance of sustainable debt, um, green bonds, with China being the second largest issuer since 2021, and other emerging markets accounting for just 10% in 2022. So governments in emerging markets and developing economies have mostly used green bonds to raise local currency financing for infrastructure projects. And sustainable de debt issuance in the Central and Eastern European region is slowly uh, taking, up, taking up. From 2009 to today, the regions issued only uh, around 220 green and sustainability-linked bonds, representing only a relatively small fraction of the global issuance. However, the vast majority of this issuance has happened in the last four years, which is certainly encouraging and signaling and uh, growing interest, especially from the private sector in this financing instrument. And at a global level, um, further efforts to increase the pool of listed clean assets in emerging markets and developing economies would support diversification, but these must happen in tandem with other strategies to reduce perceived and actual risks in those markets including uh, increasing public capital and uh, concessional tools. So the IEA is, uh, is very much engaged in this area, as I said uh, at the beginning. Uh, we really want to um, and will be continuing to contribute to um, the debate and discussion, the policy recommendations on sustainable investing um, in this year, uh, too, in particular. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be releasing the World Energy Investment 2023 report in June. And we'll also be releasing a report on scaling up private sector financing for clean energy transitions in emerging market and developing economies um, at the summit for a new global financial pact that President Macron will be hosting in Paris um, June 2023 of this year. So um, really, uh, once again, thank you so much for the invitation um, to join you. Really look forward to the uh, other keynote remarks and the panels today and uh, and really look forward to further engagement uh, uh, with the with with all of you thank you
Thank you very much, Mary, and thank you for sharing already some insights from the upcoming report. So it's actually very interesting to see that there is a growth in green bonds. We had some conversations here yesterday about green bonds. So fingers crossed we will see a lot more of these investable assets and this financial instrument. I would like to give the floor now to Giles Dixon, who will, uh, yeah, tell us some more about renewable energy. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Linda. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Where is wind energy in Europe today? The blue bars are the gigawatts installed in each country. The red bars are the share of wind in every country's electricity mix. Wind is now 17% of all of the power we consume in Europe. Let's zoom in on Central and Eastern Europe. People think it's a bit of a desert for wind energy. Far from it. Wind is already more than 10% of all of the electricity consumed in Poland, Lithuania, and Croatia, and Romania. Where are we going from here? Ah, let me just show you the electricity mix for selected countries in Central and Eastern Europe. The wind is the light blue, the black is coal, the gray is gas, the orange is nuclear. So yes, we're over 10% in many countries, but we have to put this in a wider context. So where is wind going from here? The dark blue bar is the capacity in the EU today of onshore wind, light blue offshore wind. By 2030, the EU wants us to have these numbers, huge growth. And by 2050, those numbers. People think wind energy is all about the growth of offshore wind nowadays. No, far from it. Look at these numbers. Most of the growth is coming from onshore wind. And this is reflected also in how the EU sees the evolution of its electricity mix over the next 30 years. Again, dark blue is onshore wind. This is the consumption mix. Light blue is offshore wind. Wind by 2050 will be one half of all of the electricity we consume in Europe. Wind is going to grow also big time in Central and Eastern Europe. True. Some countries, Hungary, want to go mainly nuclear. Other countries, Poland, Romania, want a mix of nuclear and wind. But it's clear, wind makes sense. Wind gives you energy security. It's a local energy resource. The wind speeds in this part of Europe are good enough. Perhaps not as good as the North Sea, but basically anything that is not green that is orange or darker, is good for wind energy. Of course, the environmental impacts are very good. No CO2, no other pollutants. Good for land use. You can combine it with farming, both livestock and arable. No water consumption at all. We can build wind farms in very dry areas. And when we do offshore wind, we have a positive net impact on biodiversity. This is an artificial reef that has emerged out of the foundation of an offshore wind farm. Next reason why wind makes sense is that the public want it. Oh, yeah? Oh, yes. Look at the opinion poll results. Do you want more onshore wind? And it's not just in Western Europe. And you know, these numbers are even higher when you ask the people who are living close to wind farms. Why? Well, they're seeing the direct economic benefits. Every onshore wind farm in Europe is paying taxes to the local town hall. Many municipalities, 10% of their budget comes from the local wind farm. On a macro level, there are big economic benefits. That's the contribution of the wind energy industry to EU GDP today. Every time we build a new wind turbine, on average, we generate that amount of economic activity. And look at the jobs numbers. That's how many people work in wind today in Europe. And by 2030, it will be that number. For all of these reasons, in Central and Eastern Europe, lots of wind farm projects are now being developed and constructed. 
and we're beginning to see the first activity on offshore wind. Poland developing lots of offshore wind farms. We see developments in the Black Sea and Adriatic as well. But, and it is a very big but, there are four big challenges we have to overcome if we are going to realize this expansion of wind energy. The first is this. This is the application for one of the five permits that you need to build one fairly small onshore wind farm in Germany. And this is replicated all over Europe. Fortunately, the European Union and national governments are now doing something about this. New rules have just been agreed at EU level, which say the following, the expansion of wind energy and solar is now a matter of overriding public interest. The judges, the NGOs can't just say, no, 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 there are biodiversity interests that trump this wind farm or solar park. Now you have to take a balanced view of the two. We don't need to strive anymore under EU law to protect every single bird, animal, or fish. We take a common sense population-based approach to species protection. And there's a new EU deadline. All the permits you need for a wind farm and solar park now have to be decided on within two years. At the same time, you'll be pleased to hear that many governments and the IEAs playing a key role in this, thank you, Mary, are moving to digitalize the permit application, the permit processing procedures, so there'll be fewer of those big ring binders that I showed you earlier. So that's the first challenge. Second challenge is we are not investing enough. Mary told us about the global picture. Here's the European picture for wind, what we've invested over each of the last 10 years. The dark blue, again, onshore, the light blue is offshore. Those are the amounts in billions of euros that have been invested each year. And the green curve shows you the capacity that that has been buying. Look what happened to offshore wind investments in Europe last year. Zilch! Partly because of inflation, not fully reflected in the way that governments index their auction prices and tariffs, but partly also because investors looked at what national governments were doing, intervening in the functioning of electricity markets, and they did not like what they saw. Or should I say, you did not like what you saw. Fortunately, the European Union is now doing something about that. We have new proposals from the Commission for the redesign of Europe's electricity markets. These will restore order. They will say governments can no longer intervene willy-nilly in the functioning of markets and spook investors. And they will say governments must ensure that renewables investors have a perspective of stable revenues, whether it's through two-sided contracts for difference or through PPAs. And this is really important because if you know you've got stable revenues, that will help you contain your costs of capital. Mary, you told us that the costs of capital are far higher in emerging economies than in the Western world. But there are differentials inside Europe as well, as you all know. Here, if you can see it, we see the differential between the average cost of capital for building new onshore wind farms in Central and Eastern Europe compared to Western Europe. But two-sided CFDs and PPAs will really help here. CFDs are great. They are cheap for governments. The yellow line is our auction price. That's our stable revenue for the first 15 years of a project. Here is the electricity price. When it's higher than the auction price, we pay the difference back to governments. Governments make money out of us. Of course, when it's the other way around, they pay us. But this can balance itself out. Today, of course, governments are in the money. CFDs are cheap for society, also because they minimize the costs of capital. There is our CFD project. Here's a project which only has market revenue. And look at the average lifetime LCOE of these two wind farms. That's what it is when you have a two-sided CFD. That's what happens when you don't, when you're relying only on market revenue, because the banks are very reluctant to lend debt to those projects. You're having to finance it through equity. 
Much more expensive, of course. So this is our second challenge. Our third challenge is we need to invest much more in grids, transmission, and distribution networks. The trough in the middle, that is today. We are not spending enough. Investment volumes have gone down. Look, compared to where they were, they need to double by 2050. And our final challenge, ladies and gentlemen, is this, the wind energy supply chain. Today, it will not deliver the huge expansion in wind that Europe wants. Yes, we have 250 factories making all sorts of components, including in Central and Eastern Europe, but this is not enough. And the turbine manufacturers and their suppliers today, they are operating at a loss, most of them, because they've had inflation in input costs, which has not been sufficiently reflected in the auction prices and the revenues of their customers, the wind farm developers, and somehow we need to do something about this. The EU recognizes there is a problem, and now it has its Green Deal industrial plan, which some see as Europe's response to the IRA, of course. What the Commission has proposed falls short, needs to be beefed up, and now is the moment to do it. The Member States and the European Parliament are finalizing the text. It's good that we have flexible state aid, so national governments can offer investment tax credits, but they can only offer capex support. Maybe they should be offering OPEX support as well, like you get under the IRA. It's good that the Commission are now saying governments in their auctions shouldn't be deciding who wins just on the basis of the lowest price, but they should be considering the additional value that the bidders are offering in terms of biodiversity, protection, CO2, life cycle, footprint, energy system integration, how many batteries, electrolyzers do you have? Oh, you score more points in the auction, things like that. Let's have a criterion which says, are your turbines made in Europe? Yes, you score extra points. That is what we should be doing. It's exactly what the Americans are doing. And we need additional EU financial support. And it's no good the EU saying, we'll give you money if you invest in innovation and technology breakthroughs. This is not a technology challenge, ladies and gentlemen. This is a pure volume challenge. We need to be building loads more wind turbines ASAP. We need more factories for this ASAP. Take the analogy. It's 1937. We've invented the Spitfire. We know it works. Don't need new aeroplanes. We just need more of them and as many factories as possible manufacturing them. That is where we are with renewable energy technology in Europe today. Finally, the national governments have an opportunity now to really get their own policy response in order. You'll be aware that a few years ago they all wrote these national energy and climate plans. They were sort of ambitious. Not very. Now they've got to update them, and the deadline is the end of June. This is a fantastic opportunity for us to be getting governments to give us the level of policy ambition we need to meet these four challenges I've described. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Giles. You definitely woke us up. We need the... The big moment of building more, building urgently, ASAP. Couldn't agree more. Hans, please, the floor is yours. Uh, we're running out of time, so we're going to try and speed up so we have enough time for our panel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you've got the clicker. Oh, yeah, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please ask you to fasten your safety belts, your mental safety belts, because I'm going to take you for a helicopter ride both through time and reality. Linda knows that this week there are many critical materials conferences going on in Brussels, and there were competing priorities there, but knowing Linda, I said, no, I'll come to you, because the financial community actually has a very critical role to play in all this. The good thing is that there's nobody in this room who would not prefer 500 million euros capital over one euro of annual income. Or is there anybody here who would prefer one euro annual income over 500 million capital? We all know capital is much more powerful than income. Well, ladies and gentlemen, energy is very similar to that. Because until two centuries ago, we lived on one euro per year income, solar income, that is. 
That's the energy that the sun throws to the earth. By the way, for the non-technical people, wind is also a form of solar energy because it's the temperature and pressure differences that cause the wind. Water power is the old wheels that you can actually see at the Charles Bridge is, of course, also solar power because how does the water get into the river? It's the evaporation cycle driven by the sun. So almost all forms of energy that we use, renewable energy, are in the course solar energy. So up until 200 years ago, we actually worked, the economy, humanity worked on solar energy of the year. And then the British discovered coal. Now, what actually is coal, or indeed oil and gas? It is prehistoric solar energy. It's the sun energy, the solar energy of the last 500 million years, which nature converted into hydrocarbons. So there's a big difference whether you can tap out of an income of one euro a year, or you've got a vast capital of 500 million equivalent that you can tap from. And we see the results. In the last 200 years, not only did the economy skyrocket, also by improving the economic living standards and hygienic standards, we rose from 1 billion people in 1820 to 8 billion now. If in the past next couple of minutes you understand four things, then my trip to Prague has been worth its while, and they all have to do with a systems view. If you will understand in 10 minutes' time this principle of stocks and flows and density and energetic remoteness, I'm satisfied. Because those are the key concepts to understand if you are in working in the field of energy. So, basically, this is a chart that shows you what we are living from in the last two to three hundred thousand years, which is the length that our species has been roaming this planet. So it was always different forms of solar flows. And then, as I said, in the 18th century, uh, we discovered coal. And what you saw is that we actually moved from solar flows, income, to solar capital or stocks. Now, it's just a percentage, so the absolute volume has gone up enormously. And what we see now is that actually the share of the solar stocks is going down because, as both Mary and Giles indicated, we do not want to use that for climate change reasons. And also, the capital is limited. The income is infinite. For millions more years, the sun will throw energy to this planet. But the capital is limited, and in actual fact, we have consumed half of all the capital. Now, if the total capital is 500 million years, then half the capital is 250 million years of prehistoric solar power. And we use those 250 million years in 200 years. So that means, on average, we used a million years of solar power per calendar year, on average. But energy consumption, of course, since the beginning of that blue, has risen. In 2020, we consumed 4.2 million years of prehistoric solar energy. So, what will happen when we will move that down, either because it's not there anymore, or because we do not want to consume it, because we would grill ourselves? What it means is that the energy mix will change again toward much more renewables. Now, what is important is that prevailing economic theories historically follow the energy mix. So, in the 100% renewables part, you had economic theories like uh, Ricardo and uh, notably Adam Smith from the Wealth of Nations. I am an economist by training, but I said to Mary, I'm an economist who has fallen off his faith, and I'll explain later on perhaps why, but I think that Adam Smith really understood reality because his theories were about harvesting the productive value of land. What can you grow on land using all the input that we get from nature? Actually, what we've been doing for the last 100 years, we've been cheating a little bit because we're no longer standing in our own time. We're actually using energy from a different time, namely from the past. And as we all know in the energy sector, 
producing energy has become more expensive. Now, we are so bright, we solve the problem. You solve that problem as well, the finance industry, because in addition to using resources from the past, prehistoric solar energy, we're now also using resources from the future in the form of credit. So we are now burning the candle on two ends. The present is not standing on its own legs. We're hanging in the sky from one ring of prehistoric solar energy and the other ring of future performance in the form of credit. But we're not standing on our own feet. Now, both the prehistoric solar energy and the future credit are finite. Both will come down, hopefully in a gentle way. So the question is, if our economic theory changed over time, so first we had Marshall, then we had Cobb and Douglas, we had Friedman and Keynes, so they all came up with different theories. Now, physics would never work like that. Laws of physics are always the same, but not an economic science, which is not a science, it is a scientism. It looks like science, but it isn't. So what then is happening? Did reality change? No. Did our perception of reality change? Yes. Are we reality blind? I think also. Now, Linda already said in her opening how important energy is for society. It is the very basis of everything. Life depends on energy and resources. Society depends on energy and resources. And in fact, our health and happiness also depends on energy and resources. Now, I've spoken about stocks and flows. Now I want to talk a little bit about energetic remoteness. And this is a really important concept. Because sun and wind, of course, are free. But the metals we need to capture, convert, store, and distribute renewables are not free. In actual fact, they're pretty metal intensive. And here you can see, for example, on the chart in the black and the red, you can see the consumption of energy, and the blue, you can see the production of copper. So basically, you know, over the last 20 years, the production of copper has remained stable, but the energy it cost has enormously increased. But the demand for copper over the last century has gone really up. Now, why is this? This is the concept of density. 100 years ago, the average quality of copper ore was 2%. What that means is if you want to have one ton of copper, you have to take out 50 tons of copper ore. Today, the average quality of copper ore in the world is half percent. So for the same ton of copper, we now have to take out 200 tons of ore. The biggest copper mine in the world is south of Santiago de Chile. It's the size of the city of Brussels. McKinsey optimized everything that's there at worst 24 seven. But at prevailing world market prices, they are only barely profitable because whilst they are a big mine, the quality of that copper ore is not 0.5%, but 0.4%. Now, you may laugh. What's 0.1% mean? Well, it means they have to excavate 250 tons of ore per ton of copper against the world average of 200. So they have to excavate 50 tons more ore per ton of copper as the world average. And do you remember what I just said? A hundred years ago, 50 tons was all we needed to excavate for one ton of copper. That is the effect of density, and that represents the energetic remoteness. We want the copper, but what do I need to do to get the copper? Actually, I should not do it like this. It should do it like an apple tree. When the apple is hanging here, that easy. When it's there, I can reach. When it's higher, I can stand on the chair. Maybe I can still use a ladder. But the apple's higher up in the tree, I can't get to. The energetic remoteness is too big. Now, the nice thing with apples is, if you wait long enough, they fall out of the tree. Copper does not fall out of a tree. So, whilst the prevailing myth is that renewables will get cheaper over time, and that electric mobility will get cheaper over time, the problem is that the people that say that, and it's the majority of people, they confuse part of the curve with the total of the curve. Because it's true that renewable energy, both wind and solar, is getting cheaper. They actually had a very big cost drop about 15 years ago. And do you know why? Because the production of solar panels and turbines moved from Germany and Denmark to China. 
So basically what I did, I substituted expensive Danish and German labor for cheaper Chinese labor. Now, unless you can tell me that you know of another China where we can relocate the production from China to this yet even cheaper country, this was a one-off price drop. But there are two more factors that help renewables. First of all, is efficiency improvement. If you get more voltage out of a certain uh, square meterage of solar panel or more power out of a wind turbine, that is technological innovation. But technological innovation is a marginally decreasing benefit. The third aspect is scale. Of course, it gets cheaper when you do 100 units instead of 10 units, and 1,000 units per unit are cheaper than 100 units. But there, too, it's a marginally decreasing benefit. Now, the important thing that you should take away is that these are typical scale curves that apply to manufacturing industry, but not to extractive materials. Extractive materials follow a different cost pattern. In a mine, initially, when you operate the mine, you've got the scale benefits, you've got the efficiency benefits, but as the density, as I just explained, is going down, the efforts to overcome that, the energetic remotes, are going up. So this is the cost curve of extracted materials. So we have this one-off of the relocation of the production, then you've got two factors that are indeed contributing to reduced cost, but they are marginally decreasing, and we've got this other factor which is exponentially increasing. So the overall, and you're all finance people, you know, under the line, the cost will go up. Now, how can recycling help? Surely if we recycle this whole stuff with energetic remoteness, you know, that will be solved. Well, let me explain this. 100% recycling is not possible. You always have some degradation or waste, but we can make huge improvements in recycling, and we need to be doing that. Now, you will understand, as we increase the share of renewable energy, we will have a lot more metals going around in the turbines, in the panels, in the motors, etc., etc., in the storage, a lot more metals. So that means that even when we do optimal recycling, the loss of wastage and degradation will go up as well as a percentage, even though that percentage should be low. And now the following will happen. As soon as the degradation and wastage in volume will be bigger than what gets added by virgin mining, the absolute availability will go down. So what we'll see over the next two centuries is, first of all, the demand will go up, supply will follow, but at great cost, and at one stage, we will have to make concessions on what we want, because we just can't afford it. No matter how we finance it, whether the EU helps or we uh, jack up the price for consumers of industry, it, we will not be able to get what we want. We may only be able to get what we can afford. But if indeed, as I just said, the recycling is optimized and the loss exceeds what's added from new, actually, the absolute availability will go down as well. And you may think this is a long period of time because your life expectancy is only 80 years, if you be careful with crossing the road, not in front of a streetcar. But for humanity, this is nothing. So basically, um, this is what will happen with energy consumption. So this is the forecast of world energy consumption in exajoule. And you can recognize that this is what will happen with global GDP because the correlation between GDP and energy consumption is actually pretty solid. Now, you may look at the margin, say, for example, oh, turbines do not emit CO2, but that, of course, is not quite true, because you need to do a lot of mining. And so we should look at things in a systemic way and not relocating them. So I feel so dirty because it comes out of the tailpipe, so I electrify it. Ah, it's now very clean, but you basically relocate the pollution to somewhere else. Having said that, an electric motor is much more efficient than a combustion engine. But this is a very important thing. So what I just explained now is that physical reality. I will not speak, for time reasons, about the Chinese control, because in addition to physics, there's also a geopolitical dimension. You may, many of you may not have heard of the element neodymium, which is a highly strong magnet. And you need that both in the turbines, the wind turbines, so you get out of a certain amount of wind more power, and you need it in the electric motors, so that means that with little electricity you get more movement. 82% of world's neodymium is in China. And over the last 30 years, China has actually engaged in what we call natural resource colonialism. 
Africa is the backyard of Europe, but we have largely neglected it. China gave big loans to countries like Mozambique, who then could not service the debt, couldn't pay back the debt, and they said, can you please sign this piece of paper that those copper mines are now signed over to the Ministry of Natural Resources in Beijing. So why is economics, which is probably what many of you studied, certainly I studied, why is it not a science, but a scientism? Well, for the following reason. It uses simplified models, no integration of natural science, looks at recent history, 200 years, 200 years forward, little or no interconnection between the elements, no or weak feedback loops outside supply-demand view, and no inclusion of black swans or breakpoints. What we need to do, we have to say bye-bye to economics, and we have to welcome ecosystem science, because the reality consists of complex systems. We should integrate physics, chemistry, and biology. We should include long-term human ecosystem history and highly interconnected components with strong feedback loops. And systemic failure risks are accepted and integrated. So this is what the future will look like. We've always been on this low energy return on energy investment, or slow, wind, solar, water, muscle, firewood. We're now in this carbon pulse peak with solar stocks. And we will go back to flows again. Now, of course, we now have got artificial intelligence, we've got computers, we've got better insights, but we will not be able to maintain an energy supply at that level. So what is it, and this is my final slide, that we need to do? We must bring energy demand in line with the energy that will be available in the future. We must use the high-density capital energy that we have now to build a society that can provide well-being to the people with less energy. So energy efficiency is extremely important. Actually, when I last worked in Brussels, I helped DG Regio to bring 600 million euros extra investment to Central Eastern Europe for home insulation. If you give a fish to somebody who's hungry, he'll knock on your door next week again. Teach him how to fish, and he'll stay away, and he nourishes himself, and he'll teach others how to fish. So we need a more systemic view. So the problem is now with the European policy, and actually policy also in the United States and in China, is systems view reveals gaps. Because what is happening, the orange line shows the quality of the energy. And we've been used that the quality always went up. But as we move to renewables, I mean, try to fry an egg in the sun when you put it on a plate. It won't fry. What you can do, put it on the bonnet of your car when the car has been parked outside, but then you actually use the bonnet of the car as storage, so concentrating. So in order to make that work, we will see a huge increase in the complexity, as also Charles, Charles described, of our energy system. And it will yield less energy. So the three things that we need to do in order to move from the present to the future is do better, that's efficiency, do less, and certain things do no more. Just like a move and you all travel, if you fold your shirts better in your suitcase, you can get more in the suitcase as if you just throw it in. So the more we can put in box one, the less will have to go in box two or three. But I can show you, my friends, in the move from the present to the future, box two and box three will not remain empty. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Hans. And now we welcome the panelists who have been patiently waiting. And uh, we will have the session moderated by Jana Czarsbach from uh, Allen & Overy. So please, our panelists to the stage. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today, and thank you, uh, the panelists, for uh, speaking on the panel today. Uh, we have heard a lot about energy crisis in the last few months or years. It was a buzzword, and some people live it, some people just talk about it, but we would like to really talk 
what's here now uh, and what's in the future. And uh, let me again wel welcome the panelists here. I'll do the short introduction. So we have uh, Andre Strecker here from uh, CHAS, who is the head of energy market analysis. We then have uh, Jan Krčmář from Czech uh, Solar Association. Hello. Jan Karabat, a director from Slovak Photovoltaic Industry and Renewables Association. Hello. Gary Mezzotti, board, uh, board member and CEO of uh, EP Infrastructure. And uh, Mary, who was a keynote mm -hmm. speaker this morning, thank you for that, uh, from the International Energy Agency. So uh, I promise we will talk about the future, <laughs> but actually, actually the uh, energy crisis was uh, so, uh, so spoken that I would like to start with uh, Andre and ask what his uh, take is on the, where we are now and whether the energy crisis is over. And uh, who should we blame for it? Uh, is it the Green Deal, as some people uh, say, or is it something uh, else? Mm -hmm. thank, you, thank, you, uh, thank you, Jana, uh, for, the, uh, for the question. Uh, actually, my, my answer will, will be quite simple. Our modeling shows that some 90% of the 90% of the price increase of electricity during the last year was caused by the uh, Russian invasion into Ukraine and the subsequent interruption of Russian gas supplies to Europe. That of course caused uh, uh, that of course led to a very high increase in gas prices, and it also led to a very high increase in so-called risk premium because of the uncertainty about the uh, availability of the, of the contracted gas supplies. For example, we as a, as a power producer, we weren't really sure that we, will, we would really receive the gas that we, ha that we uh, had bought uh, on the energy exchange because at the time there were many discussions about gas rationing, about the preferences of, of household and so on. So after all, we, th there was uh, this danger that we would uh, end up in a, in a situation that we sold our electricity to our customers, but we wouldn't have the gas to generate the, the electricity. So uh, the market priced this uncertainty uh, into electricity prices and all these two factors, the direct gas factor and the indirect risk premium uh, translated into, into very high electricity prices. Then you are right that uh, we, we have often heard about, uh, about other factors, but uh, according to our modelings, these, the effect of these other factors uh, is, is really minor. Um, many people talk about the negative effect of, of the Green Deal, uh, of the emission allowance of the German energy and, and so on, but uh, the, these hypotheses are just not true. Let me give you an example. For example, the emission allowance, it started the year at 88 euro per ton and it ended the year at the same 88 uh, euro per, per ton. So uh, the effect of the emission allowance last year was, was null. The, the same with the Green Deal. Uh, actually, uh, Green Deal is not the cause of the energy crisis. It's, it's a part of the, of the solution. Because what, what is the objective of the, of the European Green, uh, Green Deal? The objective uh, of, this, of this strategy is to reduce uh, the emission of the CO2 uh, in Europe. So, you basically want to decrease the import of the fossil fuel. And the same objective is, uh, is good for, for the energy uh, independence. So basically there is, there is a, a synergy between, between uh, the decarbonization of the objective and the uh, uh, energy, energy security objective. Then you ask whether, we, uh, whether the crisis has already ended. Uh, well, we think that uh, the situation is, is improving. Uh, the, the LNG capacity uh, in Europe is, is growing. The, the share of renewables and, or the capacity of renewables in, in, in Europe is, is growing. 
And uh, we were also lucky that the, that the past winter was quite mild, which uh, left us with uh, our gas storages uh, considerably above, above average. So the outlook for the next winter is uh, quite optimistic, I would say. Uh, on the other hand, I, I would like to, 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 to stress that uh, the global LNG uh, balances are still quite tight because it will just take some time to replace the, the Russian gas to, to build all the necessary uh, liquefaction infrastructure, regasification infrastructure, and the, the LNG ships. But we expect that it, it can take some two or three years uh, and then the, the, the situation, the, the, the global market will find again a new, new equilibrium. We won't probably return to the pre-crisis levels of 20, 20 euro per megawatt hour, but we, we believe that the new equilibrium will stabilize somewhere around 30 to, to, to 40 uh, euro per megawatt hour. Uh, which more or less corresponds to the, to the U.S. Uh, long-term marginal cost of the U.S. Uh, US uh, LNG gas. Thanks, Andre. Maybe I would also ask uh, Gary whether uh, he has something to add and what's your view, Gary, on whether we are out of the woods yet because, Andre, uh, I, could, uh, I could hear some positivity in your, uh, in your tone. Uh, so let's see whether uh, Gary sees the same way. Well, I, I clearly don't want to agree with Chess, but yes, he's correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, clearly, um, mm. gas prices have, have come down to around the 34 level, so I agree with Andre that that's roughly where gas will settle. Electricity has come down now to 110. I don't see it peaking again. So I think we, we're going to have a long-term average price of energy, which is roughly double what we had in the past, but I don't see any return to the to the spikes we had last year. And, and positively, we have clear indications from governments that if it does happen, they will intervene, which is, uh, which is useful. So I agree. OK, and Mary, because you probably uh, could see it more from the, uh, from the global scale, well, what's, your, what's your take on this one? Well, I think, um, yeah, I agree with much, much of what's been said uh, already. I think it's really important to acknowledge just how, how, how well, really, Europe was able to respond uh, over the past year in terms of the, the energy crisis, the gas cutoffs, and so forth. Um, I think, um, yeah, as you mentioned, there were a number of factors that I think um, made it uh, a little bit less demanding uh, uh, in terms of um, in, uh, in, in terms of some of the external factors, a less severe winter than anticipated, and a few other things. But it was really, I think, uh, impressive in terms of the policy direction that was uh, given and the t determination to really uh, diversify um, energy supplies um, across Europe. Filling those um, gas storages, I think, was really important, and uh, the degree to which they were uh, done so well, um, and again, given the the state of the climate last year, those storage tanks are in a better position now than they've been in quite a number of years, and so refilling them won't be um, quite uh, necessarily um, as difficult. Um, but you know, Europe also really um, took advantage of this moment of crisis to uh, accelerate the energy transition, and um, I can come back to that. But there was some very positive. Uh, uh, results in that effect. I would uh, just flag that I think as we look ahead to the next winter, um, it's it, it's maybe prudent to be a little bit cautious in saying we're not necessarily out of the woods, given the some of the exogenous risks that we've um, described. Um, possible we could have a more difficult summer, a harder winter coming ahead. Um, you know, with uh, with China reopening now and their increased demand for um, LNG and gas supplies um, will likely have an impact. The state of play in terms of continued developments with um, LNG, um, uh, uh, new LNG supplies being brought onto the markets is also something to keep a close eye on. We've seen some encouraging results in the US and, uh, and, and elsewhere. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, yeah, so I think important to, to keep an eye on, um, on all of those uh, uh, external uh, factors. In addition, though, Europe has uh, been done very well in terms of reducing its reliance on Russian gas now uh, importing 
you know, 80% less than it did a year ago. It's still ten, got about 10%, if I understand correctly, gas flows coming from Russia. There's a possibility that those could be completely cut off, and that's yet another factor. So um, very good results, very much to be, uh, I think, for, for Europe to be uh, congratulated on in terms of its strong uh, response last year, but also important to continue to be mm. watchful in the, in the months ahead. Thank you. And it seems that uh, you mentioned uh, basically renewables or new energy mix is one of the solutions. So uh, maybe, uh, yeah, uh, Jan, uh, if you can please talk more, more about it, more, what is preventing uh, this to be uh, developed even more or quickly? What are the barriers? What, what do you see as the biggest ob obstacle here? It was already mentioned before by Giles, um, it's, it's, it's permitting. Um, last year, the Czech, uh, Czech Prime Minister Fiala, in a uh, public television address, promised um, the, the public that he would not let them fail, he would not let them fall, and that, among other government, would pledge huge or unprecedented support to solar power. Um, we reacted very quickly by pointing out that we don't need more money in the sector, we need uh, fewer papers and forms to fill out. That is what's holding renewables back, it's permitting. Um, what was mentioned before by Giles, overriding public, public interest, all these approaches coming from Brussels, those are not directive, those are suggestions and frameworks that member states can adopt if they want to. Now, Czechia has made no uh, significant steps to introduce overriding public interest. In fact, we had to fight as the sole association in Parliament to even, uh, uh, to even push through a normal, regular public interest for renewables. Which, which we pushed through. Um, and the, I think, so permitting is one, is, is, is one big pillar. We really need, we need uh, stronger political uh, decisions that would really cut through red tape. Take decisions out of local municipalities and, and, um, and local governments to some extent, or regional governments. Because I grew up in Vienna, those of you who know the landscape between the Czech border and Vienna, you know there are tons of wind farms there. There was not a single wind farm and wind turbine when I was a kid, when I was growing up there. The difference is there were strong local politicians who were able and, 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 and courageous enough to stand up to their own electorates and inform them that yes, maybe wind turbines don't look good, but we need them and they will be beneficial to our, to, to our region. And this is why there are wind turbines in Austria today. This is where the, why there aren't any wind turbines or hardly no in, in the Czech Republic. It's not because the wind doesn't blow, that's not true. Um, as we saw on the map, there are many regions, and if you fly, for example, from Prague to Warsaw, you can spot and actually see the border uh, uh, because, because all of those wind times, turbines suddenly springing up. Now, the second pillar is um, investments, uh, investor confidence, investment stability. The reasons why we don't have um, many new projects in the solar sector and in the wind sector, one of the big reasons is that Czechia was not a suitable uh, investment destination for renewables over the last 13 years. We had a big solar boom in 2009, 2010, where we installed two gigawatts of solar as one of the first countries in Europe. We were one of the largest PV, um, uh, PV destinations in the world. But then the state introduced, I think, a total of 12 retroactive measures against the solar and renewable sector. And with each of those, banks were, were, uh, were, were getting increasingly nervous. Investors were leaving the country. Today, we have Czech companies building power plants in Australia, Chile, India, Ukraine, Poland, wherever. And they're slowly coming back to the Czech Republic. But again, it's something which we're not getting rid of now. The, the, the Minister of Finance again wants to cut subsidies for existing power plants, which, and since Friday I have my phone ringing, banks are calling me and asking uh, what we think of this, they're nervous. Investors are pu already putting new projects on hold as of this week, so we have this again and again and again. So it's not pouring more money into the sector, it is about getting rid of permitting, um, uh, stabilizing the sector, realizing that you can't punish old investments without affecting new investments, and the third thing I think is, is very critical uh, it, on, on, an, on a systemic level. Um, when we come back to the, to, the, uh, to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it's not that Russia invaded Ukraine. It's that Russia invaded Ukraine for the third time. So I was, I was shocked to see how surprised people were last year that they actually did this. <laughs> so this is... This is so um, who would have thought that the country that invaded 
Ukraine twice already, annexed Crimea, shut down a commercial air island, killing hundreds of people, raised Grozny to the ground, used chemical weapons in Syria, bombed hospitals, bombed schools. Who would have thought that that country was not a reliable business partner? Well, it turns out the renewable energy sector did. If you look at uh, who among European politicians has the clearest line uh, when it comes to Russia, among others, or the frontrunners, the German Green Party. Uh, Foreign Minister Babak was one of the people who, before the uh, Ukrainian invasion, uh, before the, uh, the third invasion, was bold enough to go to Moscow and stand up to Lavrov and Putin. Um, and what I said last year was, it's not the third pillar. This is really important. It's not only about getting uh, about decreasing our reliance on Russian gas, but we need to get rid of the people who told us that relying on Russian gas is not a problem, because that's. This is one of the key aspects. We need to identify, or we just need to stop listening to people who told us, ah, oh, it's going to be fine. They will never attack. Ah, uh, it'll be fine. We can, we, can, we, can, we can gasify the entire Czech district heating sector with Russian gas. It'll be OK. Of course, it's not OK. And I'm, I'm saying this, by the way, fully aware that I am a representative of the solar sector that has a big problem with reliance on China. We must get rid of our reliance on China because it's, it's again, um, and by the way, this, this is one of the, one of the biggest topics, topics in the European solar industry. It'll be a big topic in next, next month at the largest trade show in Europe at InterSolar. It was already a lot, huge topic last year, in the last years, at the European uh, Solar Power Summit in Brussels. And I'm, I don't know, but I'm not sure whether it is such a big topic at the trade shows and, and congresses of the European producers, or of, of companies producing mobile phones, speakers, headsets, lamps, because all of this was made in China. We are actively, as the solar sector, looking into this because we know that we, we, can't, we, can't, we can't say uh, we, we, that we need to lower dependence on Russian gas and don't address the problems in our own backyard. Thanks, Jan. And uh, maybe just uh, for sh uh, to give a place to Jan uh, to react, uh, because uh, he basically comes from a similar association uh, representing renewables in Slovakia. So do you see the, the principles basically same? Uh, is it the stability that, uh, that the uh, renewable sector needs most? Sure. Uh, you may be aware that Slovakia imposed a great uh, uh, ban for, uh, for seven years. So there was a clear state intervention into our market and totally destabilized the, the whole renewable energy and, and other, you know, uh, just energy sources uh, and the development. And, and, and we are still, even though this ban was canceled uh, two years ago, we, are st we still see the impacts of that, and we will see these impacts uh, for, for, some, for, some, for some years to come, because obviously uh, this investment stability is uh, something that is hugely needed uh, for some continuing business and uh, for, for, uh, for business models to really uh, find their ground and then and, and take off in a sustainable way. We are in a conference where sustainability is the, the, the buzzword, right? And well, sustainable really is uh, this, this thing too. Uh, we lost two major uh, primary energy sources and access to it. I think this was a huge deal and we sort of needed this. Uh, I'm, I'm saying that uh, it's not maybe a 100% positive thing for, for, for common people because the energy prices ra arose. But we, uh, because of the decarbonization and the net zero goal, we needed uh, this uh, kick in, uh, into our butt. Uh, and, and because of that, uh, we, will, we are going to see and we are already seeing new business models being developed also in the renewable energy, mostly in the renewable energy sector. Uh, and, and I'm very happy about it. Uh, what we firstly uh, we need is also the policy to really be implemented, not just uh, see it in the paper uh, and, you know, just new directives being rolled out uh, every 
half a year, pretty much. Uh, but we, we need to implement these uh, policy changes. We need to uh, get the laws done. We need to uh, find a way to, to overcome this public interest uh, and overriding public interest. This is a huge thing because people are, you know, they have been uh, massaged by, by this accessibility to energy for too many years right now. And, and, uh, and it's because of the government, what they said. The government will say, well, you have cheap energy, we will we'll provide cheap energy. But they cannot provide cheap energy now, and they will not be able to. This is the market's play, what, what, we'll, uh, what we, we will uh, definitely we'll be finding ways to, uh, to, do, to, to keep access to energy, but it will not be cheap enough and not certainly not cheap uh, for the politicians to. <laughs> so th th it's something that uh, we will, uh, it's a big driver for, for the market, and I believe it's a very big driver for renewable energy because the investments have been uh, diminished. As we saw like last year in the wind sector, there was a big uh, slump. Uh, and, and in the solar sector, of course, this is a, a major play because uh, you, the access to capital is very important in terms of uh, we are playing like euros per megawatt uh, game uh, and, and uh, <coughs> every euro per megawatt hour uh, is, is uh, it's something that will, uh, will uh, definitely play some, some role. Okay, so <coughs> every, every time you get... Uh, uh, above some level, you can do the project. Okay, anytime you cannot do this because of uh, government interventions, because of uh, cost of capital issues, inflation rates, or whatever, you are not going to be able to implement the project. So, and that will ultimately uh, hamper us in 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 the, in, in our road uh, to, towards net zero. Mm. Okay. Maybe. If I may, yeah, sure. <laughs> one more observation. I, I would maybe add one general obstacle that, uh, that caused the delays in uptakes of renewables, at least in the Czech Republic. I think that uh, there is, at least in the Czech Republic, there is uh, some sort of public uh, resistance uh, against, against uh, renewables. And the politicians answer these opinions and um, Consequently, you can somehow uh, sometimes hear that uh, we have to protect ourselves from the from the green madness coming from coming from Brussels, and uh, it's very difficult to explain uh, to to the population that in fact today uh, renewables are the cheapest source of energy and that there are like true benefit in the developing renewables. So, I, I think. That's one of the main problems, at least in the Czech Republic. Okay, so uh, what I'm hearing is stability is a key, support maybe to increase the uh, public uh, trust in renewables, but then it comes to, to the goal, which is uh, to mobilize the finance for the whole sector, which stands behind all of the regulation, all of the proposal we have seen, and the plans. So, Mary, what's your uh, basically take on how this cooperation can help in ensuring that what, uh, what uh, the colleagues like just mentioned, how, how the trust can be increased uh, and the, the right finance uh, sources uh, obtained? Great. Well, thank you. Um, maybe make a few comments first on the situation in Europe and then, um, and then widen out the scope just a little bit. But I do think it's important to acknowledge um, some of the success and really important success that we've seen over the past year. While we're also looking at the challenges, look at what's been accomplished and how uh, we can build on them. So um, our data shows that within one year of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the EU is now seen more broadly. So I'm not just talking about the CE region, uh, but across uh, Europe, 40% um, more solar and wind power additions, 40% uh, more heat pump sales and installation, 15% more electric vehicle sales, um, investments in energy efficiency have really jumped, and this is an area where more gains can be realized. And uh, CO2 emissions across the EU have, in fact, fallen by 2.5%. So 
the challenge of the question is, uh, among other things, um, how do we continue to build on that because there's much more to be done. And I, I think there's no question that policy uh, really matters. And uh, again, if you if we sort of scope it out a little bit, I think it's the commitment to decarbonization and our, our, our broader climate goals that really need to be kind of seen as the overarching policy that, that are going to drive um, the very important investments in renewables and in clean energy technologies. And we have uh, something like 50% of the clean energy technologies needed to get to 20, uh, to get to, we have the technologies available to get to 2030, but we've got more technology to develop to get to our net zero by 2050 uh, uh, goals. And I do think, uh, you know, government incentive programs do matter as well. I know this was mentioned a little bit earlier, but the Green Deal industrial policy, you know, like the, um, the Inflation Reduction Act in, in the U.S., I think um, does include some really important incentives that would not otherwise be there to assist with the development of those investments and, and technologies, uh, this specifically in those uh, air, hard, some of the hard-to-abate industrial areas that will be, be uh, very um, challenging. All that, uh, I'd also say that, um, you know, supply chain risks are important, and I know that was also touched upon by Giles a little bit uh, earlier. We've looked at this in our energy technology perspective report that came out early this year, and there's no question that the co geographic concentration of some of those not only critical minerals, but clean energy technologies uh, and processing, manufacturing and processing more broadly are concentrated in too few a number of countries which can present uh, risks going forward. Um, but um, that, that being said, absolutely agree. It's not only policy and stable policies that are important and regulatory environments that can, uh, that can really help, such as uh, on uh, streamlining permitting. Um, but adequate financing, you're absolutely right, is, and affordable financing is really important, not only in the emerging and developing economies where we're doing a lot of work, but elsewhere in Europe, as, as Giles pointed out as well. And then I would also add, um, I think it's really important, and I know many countries are looking closely at the issue of grids, which also constitute a growing risk and bottleneck in many um, European countries to really accelerate renewable deployment and, uh, of course, um, maximizing wind and solar PV investments is going to require really investing in grid expansion and refurbishment so that this can all be managed well. So there are a lot of pieces um, to look at. This is a particular subject uh, as well that the IEA is doing some new work on, and we uh, anticipate in the coming months to come out with a new report on, on grids. But when it comes to you know sort of the issue of, um, of adequate financing more globally, as I said, we're looking very closely um, at the issue of, in emerging and developing economies where the cost of reducing emissions is far lower than in uh, many advanced economies, but the financing that is uh, available is, uh, is much, much less. And um, we estimate that nearly one trillion is going to be needed every year on average in developing economies between now and 30 for us to get anywhere uh, uh, to be aligned with the 1.5 degrees um, uh, Celsius sen um, uh, um, scenario. And um, I, I mentioned, I think already, yes, this report that we are coming out uh, with soon uh, with the IFC that looks at the issues of uh, concessional financing by development finance uh, uh, institutions and the role that that can play in helping to accelerate and attract the necessary private financing and capital, which will ultimately be uh, most important in, in being transformational. Our view is that that capital is available, but there are many issues that need to be addressed. Uh, to make it um, flow in, in, in broader directions into that part of the world and, and also to, to countries, uh, countries elsewhere who are much in need of more financing. It is also very complex, all the regulation coming in. Uh, can you see how the market participant basically look at all of this and see just its regulation and don't see that link which is behind it? 
maybe a question for some of those who are actually participating in the, in the markets themselves, because I, I think that's really, really an important question. Gary, can you, can you see the link between uh, uh, the initiatives and uh, uh, new capital being found to fund all, all of the transition? That's a huge question. <laughs> the, the quick answer and, and maybe the controversial answer is clearly no. Mm. Um, but to, to explain that would take, would take several hours, but it, it's a huge, um, there's a huge mismatch between regulation and the reality on the ground. And, and, and until that's solved, then you will continue to have enormous problems with the real deployment of renewable energy, particularly in this, in this region. Capital's not the issue, private enterprise is not the issue. The problem tends to be regulation is done in a way which is prohibitive to the development of renewable power as opposed to encouragement. And, and I know that's controversial, but I, I really think regulators need to look at the reality on the ground and their regulations and understand that there's a clear mismatch. It's not my opinion. The reality is it's simply not enough solar or wind is being deployed in Central Eastern Europe. It's not due to private companies. It's not due to capital. It's not due to energy companies. It's simply due to the regulatory framework is not working. And unfortunately, those that put in the regulatory framework always think they're right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, sorry for asking that controversial question. I have uh, one even more controversial, <laughs> maybe. Uh, and uh, <laughs> that is because uh, we have seen very nice uh, picture of uh, how the uh, solar been here forever, basically. And uh, we have ju just used uh, what's, what's, transform what's transformed from that, which is the coal. And uh, we, we have a lot of coal still in the sea, especially Poland, as we could, uh, could see on the picture. So uh, I wanted to ask uh, what, what you think about uh, how the transition uh, will go uh, for phasing out the, the coal. And uh, the second question for that is, whether we need to wait for that to happen before we elaborate the, the new sources like hydrogen and, and, and so. Okay, I'm not quite sure why I'm asked the question on coal. But, uh, <laughs> um, EP infrastructure is one of the largest um, energy distribution businesses in Central Eastern Europe. I transit gas, I distribute gas, uh, I distribute electricity. I have the largest gas storages in Central Eastern Europe and the largest gas storages mm. in, in Germany. My parent company is one of the largest power producers in Europe with operations in England, Ireland, Germany, France, Italy, Holland, uh, Slovakia, and, and, uh, and, and a little bit in Czech Republic. So w our role is to bring energy to consumers, either by producing it or distributing it. So where are we? This is the Sustainable Finance Commit Summit. I'm a very simple CEO, I'm, 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 I'm not particularly intelligent. Where are we going? So, in 2050, we are net zero. To be net zero, we need to produce all of our energy from renewable sources. Nobody disagrees. But we also need to find some way of ensuring that renewable power can be deployed consistently all of the time. And to do that, we need a mechanism to store renewably sourced power for the long term. And I hate to be controversial, but it's not electricity. So, and it's not batteries. So let's go back to where we were last year. Renewable power, and this is really simple, but renewable power does this, renewable power output. When the sun blows and when the wind blows, it goes up. And when the sun doesn't shine, it goes like that. And if you deploy three times more renewable power, what does your power curve look like? <laughs> it looks exactly the same. The consumption of electricity, if I'm right, goes something like that, that, and that during the day. So what you need is a medium that supplies base load electricity, maybe that's too controversial, backup electricity, standby electricity. So what mediums can supply that? Nuclear, oh, the French nuclear fleet 
was in severe difficulties last year. Output from French nuclear went down dramatically. German nuclear is now shut. So nuclear can play a role, but we have some real problems in the nuclear scenarios. Um, it can be produced in limited way by wind, but the wind didn't blow last year. It can be supplied in limited supply by hydroelectricity, but there was a major drought in Europe last year. Um, it can be supplied then by gas, but we had a major gas crisis last year, and the Germans, bless them, put all of their eggs in one, in one basket. So the only way Europe was rescued last year, consumers were able to survive, and industry was able to continue production, was that a huge number of coal plants from England, Ireland, Italy, France, Spain, were reopened. Disaster. So can we do without coal? Yes. Can we do without it now? Yes. But you need to solve the problem as to where this base load or backup electricity is coming from. Can nuclear play a role? Yes, but not in Germany. Can coal play a role? Absolutely not. The financial community is running away from coal, and therefore you come back to gas. Gas is the transition fuel to a net zero economy. It may no longer be Russian gas, but it will be gas. And if you look at the LNG contracts currently being signed, the fact that European gas storage is today a 60% full, there's already been significant inputs of LNG into Europe. So as, as my colleague said, in two, three years' time, European gas supply will be solved with primarily American LNG. In every country in Europe, all the coal plants are being closed down in favor of CCGT, OCGT power stations, gas. Is that good news? Well, I would say yes. We're currently at step A, and we want to get to step Z. Gas is somewhere in the middle. It's far from perfect, but it's far better than we have coal. And the beauty of gas is it provides the stepping stone to the future, because the only way to store long-term, renewably sourced power is green gases. Green methane, synthetic methane, biogas, but primarily hydrogen. Hydrogen is the only way to provide renewable energy support. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, and explaining the link between uh, the past and the future. Uh, and maybe Andre, uh, because uh, you're an analyst and uh, you basically know the projections for all of this. Uh, mm. Do you see the, the transition and the importance of gas uh, similarly as, uh, as just uh, Gary explained? Yes, definitely. I, I would say that gas will be very important uh, transition fuel in the near future. Uh, in, in general, we see that uh, the end of the coal generation in our region, maybe with the exception of Poland, can be, can, can be quite fast and not because of the, the regulation, but simply because, because of the market forces. I give you an example. Uh, when you produce one megawatt hour of electricity from a lignite plant, you need one ton of CO2. If you look at the uh, energy exchange, you realize that yesterday the price of one ton of CO2 for 2026 delivery was something like 100 euro. If you look again at the energy exchange, you realize that you can sell your megawatt hour of electricity at 110 euro per megawatt hour. So you sell your electricity at 110, but you have to pay this one ton of CO2 uh, at 100. So you are left with 10 euro per megawatt hour, uh, and you need to pay uh, 
do call itself, uh, pages, uh, OPEX, and so on. And uh, in the long term, it's just not sustainable to, to cover all these other expenses with just 10, 10 euro per megawatt hour. It doesn't mean that the coal uh, will end by 2026, because uh, I, I was talking about the so-called base load price. There will be certainly periods with, with a higher price. But what is certain that uh, the situation for coal plants uh, will be uh, tougher and tougher. And uh, regarding, uh, regarding the hydrogen, uh, no, I, I don't think that the hydrogen is a necessary condition uh, to, 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 replace, uh, to replace coal. I think that uh, hydrogen will uh, play its role in the energy system, in the energy transition, by providing uh, the, the flexibility uh, to be able to integrate, uh, to integrate renewables. And in the longer, longer horizon, uh, it will also partially replace gas. Thank you. And uh, maybe because we talk about, or Gary actually mentioned uh, what the, uh, how the period of uh, renewables look like and uh, how it can pose the problem. So my question for Jan is actually, what should be the right mix of those renewables to, to, you know, to prevent this, at least to some extent, what's, what's possible? Me, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, coming from a very small market, uh, it's maybe uh, something that I'm not an expert on, uh, but regardless, I will share my view. Uh, I'm, I'm actually uh, more optimist than Gary is uh, in terms of uh, that we won't handle it. I think we will handle it. Uh, I think the storage will be developed uh, qu more quickly and uh, the batteries will play a much uh, greater role in balancing uh, electricity. Uh, the Solar Power Europe uh, published in 2020 a 100% uh, Renewable Europe uh, report, and they said that uh, to get to net zero, you will, we will need uh, just about 8 terawatts of uh, solar PV and uh, 1.7 terawatts of wind, okay? That's a lot of uh, renewables, intermittent renewables. Of course, uh, these renewables will uh, have some profile. And I don't think the profile will be magnified the way Gary said, uh, because they will be distributed in some way. And it's not gonna be like the peak goes and peak down, because we will be able to, uh, uh, to sort of distribute it in a more even way. Uh, so, in the C but coming back to your question, okay, so uh, CE region is a sort of, uh, has some specifics, okay? Uh, the specifics are that the, uh, the wind doesn't blow so much as in Denmark or in Germany or some, some uh, okay, uh, maybe the UK. Uh, we don't have too much land for solar PV. We have a lot of roofs, by the way. We have a lot of uh, phytomass, okay, so uh, biomass that is, can be used and it's not, can, doesn't fit into the stock uh, because it can be renewable, okay, once we properly use it. Um, so it's gonna be some combination, okay, and there are three things that to consider. Uh, one is technical feasibility, okay, so the access to the, the technically access to the resource, okay, so for solar PV and wind we have that. It's not a problem, okay? We just need to find the right technology and we are finding more and more technologies to uh, access this. Uh, the, the, the environmental is, uh, feasibility, uh, that's, that's a big issue, actually one of the biggest issue in, uh, issues in Europe because it's overstated and overrated probably. Uh, uh, in, in wind, we see that uh, the not in my backyard syndrome and, and all these things, okay? So that's something that only co uh, policy can change and some kind of mediation uh, in the, in the social, uh, some social pact, okay, in fact. Uh, so, uh, and the third thing is the economic feasibility. That's something that's uh, by the governments uh, always neglected, that it has to be economically viable to produce the electricity, it has to be a stable environment. 
So we will see definitely um, much more development in, of solar PV and wind because we have that. And it doesn't cost us uh, that much. It's just about capital investments, okay? So we have the capital. We just need to properly allocate the capital. And we get we need to be able to do this in a certain time frame that has to be speeded up, okay? So we have probably the instruments to do that. Uh, I'm certain we will use more biomass, but it's, there is limited potential. Geotherm, very limited potential and not enough technology uh, yet, especially for deep geotherm, so we will use that for, for heating mostly. And then comes the question about uh, uh, nuclear, okay? <laughs> because uh, the, the, the thing about nuclear, uh, I'm not on a, hardly like a big expert on nuclear, but one, what I understand is it takes a long time to build nuclear power plants, okay? And you can call it any way you want, small, medium, uh, uh, SMRs, whatever. You, just, you face the same safety concerns pretty much. And you face this even huger concerns uh, in terms of uh, environmental uh, feasibility and, and uh, even technical feasibility, and then the recycling and, and uh, all these things. So will it help us towards net zero in, let's say, 25 years' time? I'm very skeptical about this. Uh, of course, it will play some role in, in the base load and we'll, we need it, we have that, so we, we will be using that, but there is a lot of uh, uh, things about how we, will, we can employ these uh, technologies and how much they will cost us, okay? Because now the costs are not really going down, they're actually going up uh, in, in, in for the nuclear. So, <laughs> so uh, it doesn't make sense in towards economic feasibility. Uh, right now, uh, without any other supports, no. There is a clear no, because we, will, we, we have seen projects in uh, the UK, we, uh, in, uh, in Finland, that have to be supported, like massively supported, to, to get it done. Okay? Then, when it starts operation, it's a great source of electricity, of course, but how much has it cost us? I mean, are we looking at really at the, uh, the, the, the same business models as we are looking at the renewables? Because in renewables, we know exactly what's the LCOE. Do we know in nuclear what's the LCOE? I don't think so. I think we are, we are uh, not being transparent enough uh, in terms of uh, what, what it really costs us. So uh, I still see that we, we, we will have to use and we should use much more solar PV, uh, much more batteries, find ways to, to integrate it into the, and of course, invest into grids. Mm. That's for me, like without this, nothing else happens because we have been under investing uh, into the grids. We, there is not enough, there is a huge deficit. Thank you, uh, Jan. And uh, because you mentioned uh, solar and how much we need to build, I'll ask uh, Jan Kritschmas, uh, because Jan mentioned the, uh, you know, the roofs. Uh, is it enough or no, yes, do we need th more? Thank you for the question. It's, it's, this is one of the big, um, big misconceptions about solar energy um, in, in the general public. It's, um, you know, solar should be on the rooftops. Let's put solar on the roofs. You know, why aren't all the rooftops covered in solar? Um, the, quest the, the answer is simply it's not enough. The reality is that if we want to decarbonize, if we want to build renewables, solar and wind, solar will be on the ground. Just an example, the, um, um, the, uh, the, I think the city of Prague is, is announced projects um, about solar, uh, sort of energy community solar projects with I think dozens of megawatts installed. Um, only the, only the pra Prague underground would require hundreds of megawatts to decarbonize. Um, Hyundai in their factory in, 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 uh, in Moravia, Silesia, are planning to put, deploy eight megawatt of solar on their rooftops. That's a really big rooftop solar power plant, and it constitutes 5% of their electricity consumption. Solar will be on the ground. It has to be on the ground. It is being deployed on the ground in Poland, Hungary, Romania, Austria, of course, Germany, the Netherlands, all those countries, uh, whether it's brownfields, agricultural PV, floating PV, but we can't survive with, with rooftops alone. Sadly, politicians and, I have to say, some um, renewable energy advocates have in the past said, well, we'll put solar on the roof and we'll be fine. It's not true. 
it's not true and it, 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 it should have been explained to the public better mm. that, with that we can't survive with solar on, on, on the roofs only. And by the way, um, today we have about 20 gigawatts reserved capacity in the grid. I don't want to get too technical, but it basically means that if tomorrow, let's say, the Czech president stages a coup um, and, and, and takes over power in dictatorship and, and announces that all the new power plants, all the new solar panels over the next 10 years have to be on agricultural land and you're, you're not allowed to, to install on rooftops anymore, it would not even take up 1% of all of agricultural land in the Czech Republic. We're talking about small, really small numbers. Uh, also, by the way, that the, the, the effect of ground mounted solar on the on the ground, on the soil is positive because, of course, if you don't drive over the soil with heavy tractors, heavy machinery, we know that a lot of farming in the Czech Republic and in former, former let's say, former communist countries is not very sustainable um, because in many, t in many cases farmers don't even own the land they farm on. And of course, if, 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 if then, it, in, in addition to that, you have, you have land that is just left alone, maybe twice a year somebody comes to check the panels and mow the lawn a bit, and in the, in, 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 in the biggest heat waves, uh, the panels actually shield the soil, soil from irra irradiation. Um, rain is absorbed better along, along constructions. It all actually helps to improve the quality of, of, of the soil. So this is something which we're saying we have to get used to, to, to the fact that solar will be on the ground. It's not a problem. It's good. It can be built in a way that's, that is not in the way. And, you know, um, one of our biggest members always says, you will have to look at something. Either you're looking at solar and wind in the countryside, or you're looking at your electricity bill, which gives you a shock. And by the way, just one last thing, I completely agree, just to put this in uh, the, the storage debate into context again. We have these big debates, storage, frameworks, and all that, and then the, the national level. The Czech, Czech law does not know the word or the meaning of storage, the concept of storage. We've been fighting for this for years and years and years. One of the reasons why we don't have large storage in the Czech Republic is because Czech law does not define what energy storage is. The reason is because there's a lot of lobbying against this from others, uh, other parts. So again, you have this big, huge debate, and then on the ground, we are battling completely different problems. Thank you, Honzo. And because we run out of time, so I'll, I'll give just a uh, uh, short uh, time to you uh, to give like short uh, final remarks. But maybe Mary, you wanted to react uh, uh, to Jan, I think. Yes. Well, thank you. And this can be my closing remark as well. But um, I just wanted to say I think it's really important to acknowledge, which I think all of you are doing, that you know, in the near term, we um, we have two energy systems, right? That uh, our economies are are relying on, and, uh, and the challenge is how we continue to mobilize the clean energy transition and our decarbonization goals uh, in, a, um, in a predictable and sustainable way, uh, while also uh, ensuring that we do have the necessary fuels uh, to maintain, especially those hard to abate um, sectors that will continue to, um, to need uh, them for uh, some period of time. It's also important to acknowledge that there are you know, communities, um, those particularly related to the phase out of coal and coal um, mining communities that will have real economic um, challenges that need to be attended to. I know you're all really aware of that, but um, wanted to just flag that this whole subject related to just and clean energy transitions that are really people centered and ensure that, uh, you know, they're, that, that, uh, that um, the issues related to the transition are not only well understood, but that there are the benefits of the new jobs that are created in the clean energy economy uh, accrue to those um, communities as well. Um, and no question that the, a whole series of technologies are important to be, are going to be important contributors to the decarbonization uh, challenge here, and you've touched on many of them. Of course, hydrogen, as that continues to develop, and uh, the uh, additional um, focus is uh, concentrated on the development of the technologies that will be needed for those hard to abate industries. Um, CCUS and nuclear, we also think, will play a really important role. 
uh, without them uh, contributing the way they can and will need to, we're not going to be able to get to net zero by 2050 goals. But I also did not want to let this conversation end with, I understand why we're concentrating on the supply side of things, but I think the demand side is also really uh, very important. And I think we've already begun to see, as I mentioned, in Europe, uh, good um, attention and progress being made in terms of the energy efficiency, but we see the real critical importance of continued, uh, keep, continuing to keep energy efficiency at the heart of, of policy um, making, um, because um, driving down our consumption uh, of, um, of, uh, uh, of the fossil fuels that we've traditionally relied on is going to be so important uh, for decarbonization goals as well, and just really don't want to underestimate the uh, importance there. Um, the IEA is hosting um, in early or mid-June, um, I think it's the sixth or seventh in a series of energy efficiency ministerial level conferences, and that just sort of goes to the, and we have uh, ministers coming from all around the world, not only our member countries, as well as from industry. So just really wanted to highlight that too. Thank you. So that, there's really no, no, no time for final remarks for everybody. <laughs> so, so I'll just, I'll just <laughs> ask maybe uh, everybody, do you see it as a promising or bleak future? Oh, well, the future is always promising. <laughs> <laughs> promising, for sure. Of course, promising. <laughs> I'm also optimistic. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you so much. Thank you, Anna, for the super moderation and all the speakers for very engaging and really positive and forward-looking discussion. So thank you for that. So this has been the first part of the Energy Day. And I think and really hope that you agree with me when I say that it was full of information. It was really, um, had a very really positive outlook, but, um, and also brought a lot of valuable insight. But one small price to pay for that, because we, had, we have heard so much information, including the keynotes, is that we will have to have a shorter break. So I hope you will be okay with that. And so let's reconvene here for the second part of the day at approximately, or maybe in 20 minutes, so quarter past 11. Yes, thank you very much.